on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Hey, welcome to Under the Hood. Thanks for joining us. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. We've got calls coming in. They're ready to ready to ask you guys questions. Not me. Don't ask me questions. I guess you can ask me questions. What kind of questions? You're always could ask asking me? us questions. What's the first song on the second side of the Purple Rain soundtrack? I should know that, but I don't. I could answer that one. What Purple is it? Purple Rain. No, it's uh, When Doves Cry. Ah. Right? Because the first song was Let's Go Crazy on side one. Then mm. side B. Okay. Look at you. I, I, I'm a fan, but not that deep. All right. Let's go to the phones and say, Dean, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, guys. How you doing? Very, very good. I've got a question for you. Um, I plan on replacing the truck that I've been driving now for the last many years on uh, next year or two and i want to get the same longevity out of my next truck as i'm have gotten now the one i'm driving now i was just wondering you guys have talked many times about boards with that 5.4 with cam phaser issues and i'm just kind of wondering if i were to find a good nice clean one towards the end of the 5.4 did ford ever address that issue with cam phaser and do anything different well i guess i we probably give a no just <laughs> let me finish, Russ. We, we probably do give a pretty bad rap on those, but the reality is we see a lot of them. And we've sold right. the rebuilders that rebuild the engines. It's their num- one of their number one engines and has been for years. Uh, so we, we have a hard time not talking about it but, it. but in all fairness, there are other manufacturers that have other problems with cam phasers and, and timing chains and different things. If the, Keeps pe- us going. if the people aren't using the right fluids and the right oil change intervals based on the use of their vehicle, it happens. Um, so yep. I, I think that for myself, you do need to pay attention to it. Um, I think that when you get out of that, you know, the 04 to 08 was definitely the highest failure range. Now we jumped into the next generation, 09 up, and it got a little better, but we still see failures. Um but not not as strong as it was for the 04 to 08s. Is that fair, Russ? Four, 4 and 5 were the worst, and then they started falling off. But now lately we've been doing quite a few 10s, 11s. Yeah, and that, um, was, that ended in 13 because that's when we started, or 14, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, they started going to the EcoBoost and the 5-liter Coyote, Coyote 302. 302 motor, which has proven to be a pretty strong engine. Overall, we've got way more customers with no problems than we do with problems. You but said no. Coyote. You said coyote. You're going to call me on that? No, I'm just curious. Who's I'm right? Just... I I think it's either. Does he say Wiley Coyote, too? Or what do that, you do? Well, oh. Wiley. Oh. oh. Wiley. Oh, coyote. Yeah. It's Coyote. Is yeah. it Wiley coyote. coyote or Wiley? But it's the yote. It's the yotes. <laughs> it's the go yotes. It's not go yotes. Uh, right? yeah, are truck. you just going to cause we, problems? We, we, Is that yeah, all maybe. you're going to do? Sorry, Dean. I can't oh. help you. So, okay. okay. That was my next question is... <laughs> Have you experienced anything on the 3.5 EcoBoost motor or the 5.0 that's got a ton of miles on them? Have you run into any cam phaser issues with those? Or are they con- uh, the problems are different, are different problems. <laughs> I mean, we're not going to win this conversation to get you a perfect truck. The the, the Coyote, 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 Coyote motor, whatever you want to say, has probably proven to be the out of that fleet in our in our experience. Less volume of them out there, but we have seen less problems with that motor than we have the EcoBoost and the 5.4. We don't get the calls on that 
302 like we do on the other ones on the 5-0. Right. You know. And so we also talk to people a lot. We have a gentleman that calls this show. We have a couple of them that have called this show regularly that have the EcoBoosts, and they have they have pulled with them. They've used them. Russ has a relative with one. They got the tow package on But they've got them. the tow package on them, and they've, they've, they've really been careful about what they do. Where we run into problems with those is people that don't have the tow package, and they use them like a tow truck. And they don't put the right oil in them, and they don't and change they, and, it often and enough. And they don't like that. Uh, it's not a good thing. So, so I, just, I, I, I don't know. I'm seeing like I'm getting talked into a circle here, and I'm probably not. People listening are like, are they going to give any advice here? Don't, if we listen to our advice, I'm not going to buy anything. I'd buy it. If I was looking for a Ford, I'd buy that truck. I'd buy the one with a 5.4. And if I have a problem with it, I'm either going to put an engine in it complete if it's got that many miles on it, or I'm going to put the cam phaser lockout kit in it, which they sell and is now 50 state legal. So why not? And just to kind of yeah. get out something I squeezed in the middle, when you're buying, if you're looking at a used truck, I do think that if you can document the, the use history and the maintenance that's what history I was just gonna ask. of the vehicle, that's going to be as, a, as important as what motor it has. Probably more important, I think. Does that make sense, Dean? Yeah. No, I thought if I could find, if I did find a low mileage 5.4 out there, very, very clean, you know, I would consider it. I would use it for towing, you know, like I, well, just they're just every year for the Mustang, really, and I'd be towing out there. Yeah. What what's uh what's your weight there when you pull that? You're seven thousand pounds, probably. Oh, it's a twenty four foot enclosed car trailer, and then the Mach one I think weighs thirty five or thirty six hundred pounds. Yeah, so you might be a little less than that, or somewhere in that range. But you know, yeah. you're you're getting up there to the maximum towing rating on a five four half ton if it doesn't have the towing package pretty quick i mean a lot of those standard ones max out around you know 8500 pounds 8000 pounds and so you're getting real close at that point and you push that Definitely wind want to be fighting, whatever i find is one with the towing package on regardless right. right and then then run mm-hmm. the vin number for that particular truck to see how it's optioned for the towing rating of that particular truck cuz everybody i I generalize too much. I, I got to catch myself. But people go to the internet or they look at a commercial and they see, yeah. well, an F 150's got a 12,000 pound tow rating. No, that F 150 right. has a 12,000 pound tow rating. All the other ones have 8,000 or 9,000 or 7,500 or whatever it might happen to be based on the option package. So gear ratio makes a difference. The cooling package makes a difference. Um, there's so many things that make a difference when they start putting those tow ratings onto vehicles. You really got to be mindful of the tow rating of that particular vehicle that you're looking at. This, uh, that's, that's the advice I would leave you with. Dean, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. And finding out if that stuff has been done, I mean, you might find either a truck that, if you're just looking for a truck, you might find one where the work has been done, or you might find one that never pulled anything. And, you know, if you know the guy who owned it and it never pulled anything and it was just a same, around town. Same thing can be said for a... 067 Super Duty that you find that's super nice, super clean, six liter diesel. If someone has done all the extra stuff to it and, and kind of what they call bulletproofed it, I jump all over it because if somebody's done it right, those motors are excellent. If it hasn't had some of those extra things done, I'd be a little more cautious or you better budget some dollars to do some things to it over time. 866 594 4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show.
Russ is on top. Shannon is on the bottom. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. 866-594-4150. From the autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? You know, it was on some of the bigger news outlets just recently, and then I had gotten a, a copy of something from a friend of mine here, but... Tesla's under a little bit of fire, um, just from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and and Elon Musk is kind of uh, he's he's playing it a little bit in the media. Mm -hmm. I think he's trying to keep it light and keep it uh, like, oh, this isn't that big of a deal. But they they're they're coming down to ask him, and I've got a copy of the letter here that's from uh, the United States Senate. Oh. And it's, Did they uh, copy you on that? Did they send it to you, no, too? Oh, no, okay. no, I didn't get carbon copied on that. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but the questions uh, in in points one through six on this letter were, um, and this one's interesting, uh, please explain Tesla's decision-making process for the design and programming of rolling stops, including when they were first considered, why they were considered, what alternatives were considered, and who was responsible Responsible for the final <laughs> approval of the implementation. Kevin, and, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> yeah, and so version 10.3 update included three different driving profiles, chill, average, and assertive, and implemented a rolling stops feature, allowing cars to drive through stop signs at up to 5.6 miles per hour instead of making a complete stop. <laughs> the assertive FSD profile specifically states that cars will have smaller following distance and may complete rolling stops. So that's... That's uh, that's that issue. They they're saying you basically you programmed your vehicle to not follow traffic laws. So I, I don't have a verdict to cast on this, but this is the question that's being asked. Um, I do have a strong stance on stop signs. I have a uncle that I never got to really know very well because he was killed by someone that ran through a stop sign. So I mean, that's a that's a strong point of our family. The only weird thing about this is going to be, they're asking the question. But the people who are going to be the judge of what happens, how many of them are actually doing well, it could, exactly it could be what interesting, it says? I just it, 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 love know, how just that works. Cooperation of others doing a breaking of the law doesn't mean it's still not breaking the law. You would think you would want to, if I personally was designing that software, I'd say, yeah, let's stop for red lights. When the light turns yellow, let's determine how yellow it's going to be and stop. Let's do things that are safe. The, the, the most, whatever the safest route would be, you think you would... Tesla Take it. needs to hire me. They yeah. just need to hire me, they and do. when they make changes, I'll just go. I'll just show up there, and when when Elon Musk says stuff, I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go to Tesla headquarters. Tesla. I'm gonna go to Tesla headquarters. Walk in and go. Hey, what are you doing? I'm gonna I'm gonna parent Tesla. I'm, I'm the coyote here to help you. I'm gonna parent <laughs> Tesla the same way I parent at home. I'm gonna walk in and go. What are you doing? Is that does that seem, is that what you, what, is that it? Is that Say it out choice? loud. Is that what you're going to do? Say it out loud. Does it make sense? Yeah. Repeat that back to me. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And so, then they'll, and then they'll just go, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> and then this is the one that really hit the news. It says, not, it's, it's point number five on the letter, but it says, reports of phantom braking have increased significantly since last October when Tesla issued a recall to correct false forward collision warnings and an automatic emergency brake events. Please describe the changes made as a result of this recall notice. The corrective actions Tesla has taken, and since learning of these more recent reports and the effectiveness of these actions. And so that there's, I mean, obviously they're trying to get to a point, you know, about something. But it'll be interesting just to see how this all plays out, because this isn't just going to be Tesla. 
this is going to be all the manufacturers that are working on autopilot software. Right. And these are all the questions that need to be answered. Uh, human, Stop calling it autopilot. Humans, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Humans do certain things without a car and a computer driving it that aren't proper. I mean, there's there are plenty of people that roll through stop signs, and they do it probably every day uh, on a stop sign that's near them that they don't think is a big deal, but that doesn't make it not ill. It doesn't make it legal. It doesn't right. make it right. So if you're programming a car to do it, you're choosing to let a car do something it's not supposed to. There's one I do every so that's, day. So that's, that's just an interesting – it's going to be interesting how this all plays out. I think if my car learned the way I drive, there's one I do every day, but I do it at 2.45 in the morning. And I think if my car learned my habits and it – I don't do it other times because if there's any – but that, that early one, that first one, I do. And, yeah, if uh, it, you automatically adjust, but I think – what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you Let's doing? Set it up like that. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Ray. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Ray, what can we do for you? Yes, I've got a friend that, that bought a new Chevy Blazer. Oh, it's a 20, 2021. And uh, the only thing she could get a hold of it, you know, the password. Whatever. Yep. And it had about 600 miles on it. And she was up by the... Uh, Found about 50 miles away from where she was visiting her dad or whatever. She pulled up. But first, she, she was in the parking lot where she was visiting her dad. And she put it in reverse and nothing happened. So then she thought, well, she'll start it all, all over again. And then she put it in reverse and nothing happened. And she was on a little incline, so she, it did roll backwards enough where she could get out of there. And shortly after that, she came to a... Stop sign and stop and put the foot up, took the foot off the brake and the car surged forward on its own. She didn't hit the accelerator or anything. And she and she hit the brake on the back again and it did it again. And the check engine light came on. Well, there's a start. If you got a check engine light coming on, it's recognizing there's a problem in the system and it wants you to work on it. And even if it didn't have the light on, that is something that immediately needs to get back into the dealership and to have them examine it to see what's going on. That thing uses a shift control module inside to put it in those gears, but it sounds like it was able to go, but come out of park and be in a neutral gear at least or in the reverse gear if it would roll backwards. But with that thing trying to lurch forward with your foot off the accelerator, that's something going on in the transmission that's allowing it to be more in a gear than is that is the torque 21 blazer drive by wire or is it mechanical? Yeah, it should be electronic okay. shift. Are uh, they all now? They're not all pretty much I think but everything shift, but what is, about throttle and the throttles are all electric. Okay. Um, a lot of the braking is electric, all the steering is electric. Um you know, some of them have a clutch with an override and stuff, but they're putting everything's going to drive by wire so the car can drive itself. You know, autopilot. Chris, assist. You know, <laughs> assist. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the car is, it has the ability to, well, they're, they're working towards fully autonomous where the car makes its own decisions and can drive. When you see these commercials of the, of the cars going down the road and changing lanes by themselves, it has to have control of the steering. It has to have control of the throttle, all that stuff. By the way, this came up recently. We talk, Ray, hold on a second. Just sorry to go off on a, but we we used to talk a lot about uh, autonomous driving and getting to different points. And we were at state, you know, what what's the the rating? One, two, three, four. What right. The, we're not autonomous at all. No. no, nothing is. But somebody said to me, they were, I was reading a thing the other day that said we don't talk about that anymore. It just doesn't come up like it used to. I mean, we used to talk about autonomous cars a lot three years ago and two years ago, and now we don't talk about it as much. No one does. But that hasn't been because they stopped advancing oh, no, it. No, right. there's, there's work going on It just constantly. hasn't come. It just isn't coming up. They're not bringing it up now as a, a feature, but they're still working on it, advancing oh, yeah. there, it, there's and semi-runs setting there, up There's for semis it. that are running yeah. down in the Texas area, Arizona area, that are running... Standard runs back and forth with autonomous semis on tests. So don't think um, that, you know, oh, they don't do that anymore. They're still no, no, doing it's it. It's still just, being worked on like crazy. Just not talking about yep. it. And so. every state has got representatives involved in mm -hmm. the people that are involved from 
lawmaking rules, uh, all these different things. Which we just learned. When you talk about it too much, it can set you up for failure. Exactly. All well, right, back now, to this, Ray, yeah. he, you need to get that vehicle into the dealership and have them scan it. It could be a programming issue uh, that's going on. It, 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 there's just a, a number of things that we're concerned about. Not so much, you know, we hate to even think about unintended acceleration because that's, that's something that freaks people out. But right. Yeah, it's lur- not accelerating. It's, it's just going into gear yeah, like and, a manual train. And then trans. it's going to have enough just a no- normal engine movement that it's going to lurch a little bit. You let the clutch out on a manual trans, it's going to move forward. That's yeah. what's happening in your automatic if that is what actually occurred. My mom has one of those vehicles, and she absolutely loves that vehicle. But I know they did have to go in for a software relearn not long after they bought it. And I don't remember what the issue was, but it was something to do with the shifting. But I don't, it would, I don't remember her describing anything like that. But just uh, there may be a software relearn. I've that had needs several in mine already that I've had to do. And one of them was with the electronic shift module. When you'd move it, you'd put it in reverse. Sometimes you'd back up. And when you go to put it in drive, you'd have to pull the drive button twice in order to get it to go into drive. And it's not supposed to do that. So I read the update and it said, no, you reprogram it. One touch for reverse, one for drive. So it had an issue in there, a communications issue. That could be the same thing. You put this in reverse, it's taking it out of park, disengaging the park pulse, so it'll roll, but it's not going into reverse. So that could be as simple as a software update for this vehicle, but that's nothing to play around with. If you got a vehicle that you can't shift. Yeah. And Russ's experience is with a Tahoe, uh, excuse me, a Yukon, and like I said, with this being a Blazer, but they use a lot of the same, same corporate mentality on how they do all this stuff. So. Set up. Ray, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. And I've noticed, too, we have a vehicle, and our work vehicles are uh, shifters that aren't mechanical shifters. Electric. The one is a knob, one is a... And I've noticed that now I'm used to it, but there are times when you make shift moves that it just doesn't do because it doesn't allow it. Yep. So there are times when you put it in reverse or drive, and it won't do that, because it's protecting itself because you are rolling and you're used yep. to rolling out of the stop, stop, you know, parking spot and stuff. So that stuff can be an issue where it just doesn't do what you think it's going to do. But in this case, it seems to yeah, be something else. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show, brought to you by Sturdivant's. You are watching a video game. Russ is on top, Shannon's on the bottom, and Shannon is already complaining about the restarting and the... Now he's complaining about the controls. Start, yes, really restart. Okay. All right, now, here we go. You ready, Shannon? So the right throttle is all I got to worry about. Really, right? Well, you got to steer it, too. Well, I know that. Shannon's on the bottom, Russ is on the top. Should I wait for him to catch up? Probably. All right, bikes are going off. By the way, we don't have the mics on for a good reason. There were just some bad words. <laughs>
Make a radio appointment each week to hear the Nordstrom's Under the Hood show. 866-594-4150 from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. If you follow us on Facebook, if you like our page and join the hoodie fan club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Dale Williams, who listens to us in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Congratulations from all of us under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. That's the place you're going to go to get trained up. Mm -hmm. You're trained to be a a technician. There's so many changes coming down the the road in the automotive industry. You've got to learn from the best, and they are the best, and they are going to teach you in one of their campuses across the United States. They've got financial aid available, um, assistance for GI Bill, Check them out at Universal Technical Institute. That's uti.edu. We're big, uh, big supporters of technical schools. In, Most definitely. In every way, yeah. I've got a sister that has been extremely successful in her career with uh, horticulture and uh, landscape design, and she went through our technical school right here in Sioux Falls. Mm-hmm. we got a great technical school, and she's got a wonderful career. Next and time she's swinging through, I have some questions for her. She loves that. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> You got a fungus in your ficus? <laughs> that is ex- that No, is actually, <laughs> she doesn't seem to mind probably as much as I do when people ask me about things in yeah. weird places. Yeah. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Georgia and talk to Bob. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Bob, what can we do for you? Hey, I need some advice on what kind of a scanner I should get for diagnosing a like a 07 Sequoia Secondary air injection system of B1444 code. And since it has these big parts, the pump, the driver, the valve, uh, uh, control valves, the ECM, it might pay for the scanner to be able to pick out one of these to buy and uh, fix it. Well, that's true. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of stuff to <laughs> Figure yeah. out on those things. Sounds like you've done a, he's done a good job of identifying the parts in the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a little Ansel AD310. It gives some live data and so forth, but I don't. It wouldn't go. You know, it wouldn't go as far as that secondary air injection system. Yeah, you need to step up a, a little higher in the models. Like um, Autel makes several different scanners from. Basic handhelds that just read codes on up to ones that do live data with the two-way communication where you're able to do bi-directional controls and activate solenoids and things like that. You just have to look at the specs for each one. Uh, You can actually go on to YouTube and look at uh, full reviews where they're showing the use of the tool and what they do, how many things they can access, and then pick the one that works best for your application. But when you start getting into bidec- uh, bidirectional control scanners, you're going to be in the, um, you know, four, four to $800 range is typical, but you can use it on pretty much any car, which is, it's, it's not like a one-time use tool. And they're upgradable. Now, just going to throw this out there, Russ, because I've heard you talk about this on the show and, and getting above my pay grade in a quick hurry when you start talking about bi-directional control and all these things. I understand the concepts, but I've just never really done it like you have and do regularly. The problem he's trying to solve in a secondary air system, is this, are we talking about the secondary air system that brings the air injection into the exhaust for emissions? Or is Common he, Toyota problem. Okay, yeah. so he's not talking about the evaporative emissions system. No. All right, so no. this is the type of tool he's going to need to really work on it? Right, correct. You're going to want to activate those solenoids and see if they're flowing air and see if they're turning on and turning off like they're supposed to. Does and a smoke machine ever come into play for him yep, with what he's doing right for, now? For sure. You can hook a smoke machine to it and activate those controls. You can pick up the smoke machines. They're getting really cheap. Uh, I think the one we bought was like 50 bucks <laughs> off of Amazon. It it's was, not like the one I bought. I was going to say, I have a smoke, no. disco ball. No, no, I bought one for those guys once at an oh. auction. That oh. wasn't a smoke yeah, machine. It was, it, was a, a, it was a respirator it, box for a paint booth. Yeah, or No, wasn't it for like a... Bring brings a, fresh air into a wasn't, suit. No, but wasn't it for a display at their store to make smoke? And it was like for advertising and it wasn't even anything to do with... No, it was a, it's, a, it's the box that you plug the hose into the paint suit and it brings fresh okay. air into the I, suit. I thought, hey guys, I bought you a smoke machine because I remember Russ saying they're always so expensive and I was at an auction of a dealership. You got and, one. Yeah, it wasn't right. <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> Does that help you out there, Bob? 
that does help me out. I think I will rent a scanner with an operator. There you go. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> they both come. They don't. They both don't come cheap. Probably. Bob, thanks very much for the call. I have a question about we, when we used to when we first started talking about scanners and and consumer scanners. At the time, the low end ones uh-huh. were a hundred dollars. And the good ones that you could get were twenty five hundred for for consumers. Right. What are we talking about now? If I want a low end scanner, what am I spending versus Bob? You just said four five hundred. Is that the top for consumers now? No. Some some of the low end are nineteen dollars and ninety five cents for the Bluetooth, the dongle you can buy to plug into your dash yep. and then it connects to your phone, and they're free and they do basic OVD two code reads. The high end ones for consumers. They're all over the board, but uh, you can get thirteen hundred dollars will buy you a really nice one. Okay, that does. Uh, th- that's a high end. You know, there's other high end ones that are more money that don't get you any more, and there's some that get you less. So yeah, I would say thirteen hundred dollar range. Okay, um, I've got one that we use around the shop now and then. That's about six fifty from Autel, and that's a a good product that does a lot of bi directional controls. I can activate some solenoids and things, do evaporative emissions, you know, like your fuel tank tests for leakage and stuff mm-hmm. like that for air evap leaks. And, and there was a time I couldn't get anything as a consumer, and how much were you guys paying oh. just for one that plugs in? Oh, there was a time where a lot of our scanners were six to 8000 bucks, and then they were a few thousand dollars a year to do the updates. We just did an update yesterday that was $1,400 on one scanner. We have three of those that are the same, and they take the same update. Wouldn't it be great if they said, oh, well, you have three of these at your shop. They're all owned by us. They all take the same upgrade. All we do is plug it into our computer and flash it. Right. But, no, you want three licenses for three different tools that, you know, you're using one at a time. No, we're going to charge you for each one. <laughs> That's it's just part of the thing. What we are finding that is irritating, but um, it's just a fact of what's going down. I had a, a vehicle we're working on. And it needs some electronic modules. We're having some difficulty programming it. So I called the company that is known as the leader in programming in the country. They work right with the manufacturers to help them with their own programming tools. And I got a, oh, yeah, well, you can't put any used modules in this vehicle because if you do, they all come with a, with a gateway identifier. And it tells the computer, the body control module looks and says, that module has a number in it that matches us and the rest of the crew. And if you take me out and you put a used part in there, a recycled part, it says that number's not right, and you can't change it. So you have to buy a brand new one. That's Uh General Motors' way of saying you buy a brand new one, and then you program it, and you're fine. But guess what happens if you replace the gatekeeper, the body control module? If all the other modules are working perfectly and you replace the body control module, you have to, must, absolutely replace every module in the vehicle that has an identifier in it with a brand new part. There's no way around it yet. Now, we did find one module that you can purchase through our partner at Dorman Products, an HVAC control module. They have taken the module, and these are OEMs. They've taken it. They have... um, gone in, figured out how to erase the code like they've done on a lot of cars with speedometers and other parts where you put it in and the first time you put it in, it learns the control of the car. You're not giving away a secret, are you? Dorman's no. not going to call and say, hey, quiet. That's how they do it. That's okay, why they're checking. able to sell you the parts at a, at a good price. We have researched so far, the company that does that programming says there are companies working on how to remove those codes so that they can be programmed. You can use those used parts, but they said as of now, that model and a few others are locked. There's no way around it. The keys, if you take and try to put a used key fob in, you can't, sort of. The key fobs are one-time use. You program them, they'll only work on one car. So what do you do if you have some, you want to buy some used fobs and put them in? You can take them apart, and one of the scanners we have from Autel allows you, it says, solder these two wires to the board at this position, plug it into our scanner, hit the button, and it erases that identifier code. So now you can program it to any vehicle you want. It's, it's open. 
we're hoping they'll start doing that. They'll learn how to do it with all these modules because what are we going to do now? If you're, are you, you know, first the manufacturer said you can't have the diagnostic data. We're not going to let you scan our cars. And then they were kind of forced through the right to repair acts to say, all right, well, we'll let you have it, but you have to buy it. And we said, well, that's fair. We want to buy it. Well, then they're saying you can't put you you can't uh, buy two of our cars and then use one for parts and keep the one you're driving and start taking parts off it because the electronic parts now we're going to lock. There, there's all sorts of tricky things you you have to get around um, through the business with even with something as simple as a tail light. So Chris, if you have a brand new vehicle, let's say you got a 21 or 22 vehicle. And it's in a little fender bender, so small that you uh, you were bumped into and broke the tail light. Well, they've replaced the tail light, and you say, "Hey, wait a second, that's a brand new tail light. Something's wrong with it." Well, it's brand new. I bought you a brand new one. What do you mean something's wrong with it? We can put in a used part. We got a certified used part. We bolt it in. It meets that OEM perfectly because it looks identical. Well, it was made by them. It ha- exactly. It has the little GMC logo in the tail light. But if you have a little fender bender and the insurance company says, well, we'll put your brand new tail light in, they put one in that's maybe a third of the price. It looks identical except right in the center where that GMC logo is, it's not there. So it's not OEM equivalent anymore. So now you're kind of, there, there are all these little things that are coming around. But I love the aftermarket because they are so adept at taking things that won't work Mm -hmm. and they're wanting to make money so they figure out ways to get in and change them reprogram recode sophisticated electronics is a huge market going forward on how it's going to get figured out and and, and like i said our partner dorman's right in the middle of that but there's a lot of manufacturers working on ways to to win this a lot of geniuses out there that are really smart on this electronics stuff. and are they trying to counter it just as fast are we in a an arms race it's a back and forth but there's there's really no winning against the tech guy that's in his backyard trying to figure stuff out. <laughs> they, they just are really good. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866-594-4150. This is the Under the Hood Show.
car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's go to Virginia and talk to Gene. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Gene, what can we do for you? I've got a 90, or our church has a 94 Ford van, one ton, 5.8 liter. And lately, after the van has been run a while and they stop, uh, and then go to start it, it just cranks, does not fire. I'm really suspecting the ignition module, and my question, basic question is, between the module and the heat sink, if I put dielectric grease, is that a good transition from the module to the heat shrink, heat, uh, shrink or is there a specific, let's say, grease that does the job better? Yeah, you're supposed to use dielectric grease in there. And a lot of people don't put it in there. I've actually seen some people take a module off and go, oh, it's greasy, and they wipe it off and they put the new one on. Yeah, that dielectric grease that came in the package with the new module, it's, you know, it's the reason that it's supposed to be on there. And we're still talking about a, a Ford with a module on the distributor, correct? Yeah, you bet. Distributor dropped in there with the old e, the EEC. The e -E it just plugs in. Yeah, that, so that... You've got two things going on here, uh, Gene. You've got a module on the outside, and then in that distributor, you have a pickup coil. And those pickup coils are, are, are known to have issues with age and years due to heat. And they'll do just what you have. You'll drive, and they'll be fine. When they get hot, they'll shut off, and they won't. You, know, you can't restart them until they cool down. So I would strongly suggest that you replace both those parts, the outside module and the pickup coil. Now, one thing you could do, you could pick up an entire distributor assembly. They're pretty affordable. I'm thinking maybe around 150 bucks or so. Usually under 200 for sure. The GM ones are right around 100. But that'll come with your distributor, a cap, a rotor, and a module all together. And all you need to do is put the engine on top dead center, mark it where it says top dead center, mark the distributor and the rotor, pull it out, put it back in exactly in the same position. And then when you start up the car, you'll need to, you know, the, the van, you'll need to time it with a, with a timing light. But that would fix all your woes instead of trying to replace the individual parts. Usually the individual parts are more than the sum of the whole. Um, mm -hmm. If you, in this case, so I, you know, you buy that module and stuff separately. But I would strongly suggest going that way if the problem is that you're having no spark when this thing won't start. This, this ignition module is on the fender well behind the battery on the driver's side. So you've it's got the next five. The five, yeah. Four or five. I so, can't. It's been so many yeah. years. Yeah, that's that's good. So you've got a pickup coil in the distributor, and then you've got a module on the fender. It's the exact same thing. They've just moved it off the distributor for heat. Does that help you out? Yeah. So you can okay. replace just the module, but if it's not sparking... You don't know whether the spark is not there because the module has got hot and shutting it down or that pickup coil is opening up. It's going to be one of the two. You could test that with a simple voltmeter at home, but if you don't want to do that, you could just replace both pieces. Can you test it at church, too, or just at home? You could test it at church, but okay. not at home. Okay. All right. Yeah. So he could uh, he could figure this out. Now, granted, he wants to make sure it is an electronic problem. He thinks it is. He could have a fuel problem. So you want to identify why it's not is starting. It, is it spark or not? I mean, do we have no fire or do we have no no fuel? And then don't don't ever discount on those Fords some of the wiring that powers the computer system up by the battery. They've got some extra wires up there that can be Two suspect. black wires that come in by the negative cable. You'll see them up front, and then they bolt to that uh, radiator support up front. Those have a problem in the connector getting corroded, and if you were to unplug it, it won't start. That's grounds for your electronic engine control So and the rest of the system. I've had those where they get, like, so corroded inside, and you go up there and you just start wiggling the wires around, and all of a sudden the vehicle starts. Now, you'll hear usually hear some clicking. Yep. If you have the key on, you move it, you go click, click, click. Oh, hey, there's my problem. Gene, find it by accident. Thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Oh, did we want to find out what color? Do we want to take guesses on the church van, what it was? Sorry. White. It's white. <laughs> yeah.
Well, maybe. But it could be maroon. I don't know. We'll let's never know. <laughs> let's go to Michigan and talk to Jim. You're on the Under the Hood show. Jim, what can we do for you? Well, gentlemen, first of all, I want to compliment you on your show. I've listened to a number of car radio shows, car talk type of things, and you have absolutely the finest show on the air. You take calls on technical issues. I think that they're call screened out of a lot of shows. They pick up the easy, low-hanging fruit, but you guys tackle everything. And I respect you for that. My Thank only you, complaint Jim. is you're only on. My only complaint is you're only on only once a week, and I want to start a <laughs> national campaign or petition to get you on five days a week. So you could do. You could do that. that. We we really appreciate those those compliments, and we do everything. You if you were watching us on YouTube, you'd see we do all those questions and answers <laughs> without any computers. We have a lot of computers over oh. here for Chris, so yeah, occasionally. I'm- you know, Chris might ha- will say, you know what, I, I want to know about something, but it's usually not, you know, I don't say, Chris, I need to know what code P0304 is. I, you know, it's it'll be something like, did they make that car in 1988 <laughs> right. or did they make it in 1989? It's those kind of things. And you can bet between me and our producer, Doug, we're not screening out any questions because we, <laughs> we think we know what the question oh, no. even is. Yeah. I appreciate the compliment. We, we, we don't know everything, but we try hard, and we want to help people. That's the main thing. We, we have our, our full-time jobs and what we do, and then we do this. Is, this is our time to help people with free car advice. We want them to be better consumers of the automobile. And if you want to take on that campaign, I don't know if I can handle five days a week, but <laughs> you, I appreciate the support. <laughs> and you're on YouTube daily, did you say? No. Or, I, or, or you're not? Well, the show, so the show is done now, and then we – we yeah. put it out on podcast as well that goes out to thousands okay. of, of people that subscribe every week, yeah. plus the you know, 240 radio and stations. We stream it while we're doing it live. And on then, YouTube. yeah, you can on YouTube itself, you could go there and just type in, go to YouTube, open it up, and type in Under the Hood Show, and you can go watch our okay. channel and, and see us. We're gonna be, and we're going to be working on that channel. It's, it's fairly new to us, and we're going to be working on that with some different ideas yeah. of things to do to it. And, you know, right now you see a lot of long segments because that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's but, the full show. But yeah, eventually we'll add in too. some more things, some more content. But we, uh, we appreciate the thing. Let's get to what's going on with your Forester. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. A 2018 Forester. I'm the original purchaser. I run pure synthetic oil that the factory recommends. It's called the Premium Edition, which is actually the second one from sure. the bottom. It's a standard <laughs> en- Forester engine. It doesn't have, like, turbocharged or anything like that. But my problem is, is if I live in I live in a place called Kalamazoo, which is 35 mm-hmm. miles east of Lake Michigan, and we get a lot of what we call lake effect snow. Not only snow, but the cold air comes over, the frigid air comes over, and seems to get colder between here and Chicago. And so, a lot of times, it gets in the I don't know if you're in southern Southern California, like a lot of these car shows are. <laughs> no, you know, like South Dakota. Things. We are in South Dakota. Oh. We're, we're right with you. But oh. We just don't have lake effect snow. We don't get lake effect snow. <laughs> just wind and snow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's terrific. I, my respect for you has gone up even more. <laughs> but, but, but the, it, it seems like whenever the, the temperature gets below twenty degrees, I have trouble starting that car. Particularly if it gets to be about ten degrees, I'm almost guaranteed. It'll be a slow start, and it's not the battery. Uh, I had that checked. Actually, I just replaced it to make sure because uh, Subaru ba- factory batteries they hear are not that good, and they last that long. But I, this was not. I had the battery tested, generator tested, when it was under his the factory warrant, you know, the original factory warranty, and they couldn't find anything. It's kind of like, well, you have to bring us a car that pro- when the, you're having the problem, but by the time the the dealership opens, and you get it in there. Instead of being 5 o'clock, it's 8.30 or 9. The temperature's warmed up. But when I try to start it, it, I can finally get it started, but it would take three or four turnovers of the engine. And then a, a, a white smoke will spit out of the back like it's burning oil. Now, I know Subaru has been known for that but I, um, in, in the past. But, you know, I've had them check the oil level before I get an oil change, and it's always, they say, it's, near the top well it's probably it's probably it's probably not that so you're not you're not talking about a slow crank you're talking about it you got good crank but you're just not yeah. firing yeah and it, here's the weird thing is I, I recently gained a new friend who's a master mechanic he's a young guy yet he bought his wife a 2017 subaru used with about eighty five thousand miles on it and he looked at me when i told him the problem he said you know what i've we've only had this couple months and my wife is complaining of the same problem 
in the same temperature. He says, I don't know what it is. He's Russ, you got any off. ideas? Yeah, there's. we've had a few of these in our own shop. With it. When it gets down around zero outside, they won't start. And we've had things as simple as coolant temperature sensors that are reading wrong. I'll pull out my scanner, and I see the coolant temp sensor is reading different than the outside temp sensor, and it's causing flooding when you're starting it. One thing you could do to see if it's kind of fuel-related, when it doesn't fire right up for you, hold it all the way to the floor and crank it and keep it there on the floor until it starts. And then once it starts, of course, let off so it doesn't over-rev. But if that clears it out, that could be an indication that you've got an, an issue going on with that. We've also had a few with leaky fuel injectors that were over-fueling the engines in the very extreme cold, and they were causing them to flood. We've just got a little bit of time. How many miles are on your car? Only 31,000. Okay. You know. if, if it, it, we do get vehicles sometimes, too, if... And, and you shouldn't have, but, you know, 2018, 30,000 miles, carbon can be a big effect on vehicles in cold temperatures. Carbon in the intake area can absorb that fuel at certain temperatures and really make them pesky to start. On the back of the valves yes. on the Subarus, I, I for said sure. Intake area. So that's something yep. to consider, that you might do a high-end fuel injection cleaning also, and it might be good for you. we got to give it back to Chris here. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Hour 2 is coming up.
Before we get to the show on our local affiliate, I want to jump on quick and let you know that due to an accident involving two semi-trucks, I-29 from exit 50 to exit 53 between the town of Beersford and U.S. Highway 18 is under a temporary closure this morning. According to the South Dakota Department of Transportation, the closure is expected to last up to four hours. Just a heads up. You're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASE engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASE master certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate. Participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. While the music was starting up there, we had calls waiting on hold, so let's get right to them and go to Mississippi and talk to Hattie. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Oh, well, good day. Appreciate y'all. I've got a 2013 RAV4 Toyota that's just turned 110000 and I wanted to know what updates, enhanced uh, transactions or whatever I could do to help it for the next 100000 and maybe pull back up the mileage, uh, uh, miles per gallon some. Well, thank you for calling, and uh, that vehicle is you know, well-received. There's a lot of people that have those that have really good performance with them and good, good reviews on them. You're saying get the mileage back up. I am kind of curious. Have you lost fuel economy, or are we, are we disconnected there, and you're talking about getting your miles up to where you can get more miles put on the vehicle? Uh, well, the mileage probably when I first got it was, you know, 32, 4 miles per gallon, and now the uh, – the indicators that that are on your dash there say 27.5. And when I talk to the Toyota places, they say have, oh, a steam engine done, and a steam engine, and this and that and the other, and some of it will increase your mi- your miles per gallon again. I got you. So there are some things in there that you can do to increase fuel mileage if it's decreased because right. of – of age, if it's got a fuel yeah. system that's dirty, you know, injectors are dirty, back of valves are dirty, things like that, you can do a fuel system cleaning and clean a lot of that gunk off of there. Oxygen sensors, as they age, they start to be slower to respond, and when that happens, they don't give you the best miles per gallon as well. Other filters, like okay. your air filter and, um, you know, mass airflow sensor and stuff, those things, if they're not clean, they'll, they can decrease your mileage but also since 2004 fuel has changed a little bit and generally overall just because of the volatility of the fuel and things like that some of the mileage has gone down a little bit you know i think that if you were to take a oh, okay. a mm-hmm. car today that was brand new that got 30 miles a gallon and take it back 15 years we would see a difference in fuel mileage, definitely with the diesels for no doubt about that. They have definitely changed with fuel quality, but the gas engines, you know, I, I would have to allow, in, in my opinion, a couple miles to the gallon right there. So if you're getting 27 and then you put that up to 29, it would be realistic that you've okay. lost a mile to a mile and a half per gallon just because your engines, you know, get the spark plugs are a little worn, the fuel system's a little dirty. Mm-hmm. So 
if it was in our shop and you were looking for a recommendation of what we would do at that age, I would look at this vehicle, pull out a spark plug and say, yeah, that's worn. Let's replace it. Let's clean the fuel system, make sure that air filter's clean, fuel filter's clean, and, uh, and then just drive it and enjoy it. The vehicle you have there is, you know, like I said, a, a well-received vehicle. Have you had any problems with it up to 100,000 miles? Timing belt. Don't forget that. No, not none. Uh, everything, everything's just great. And uh, that clean the fit, have uh, have it cleaned in its spark plugs. And I do change my filter interior often and the exterior also under the oh, motor. Oh, sure. So the oxygen deal, oxygen deal right there. I'll Sensor. Talk about that. But okay, so those two right there. And I went to the Toyota dealer, and they gave me about three things they recommended. It might be up to hundred. $900. So, well, and each one of those ser- each, each one of those mm-hmm. services that they offer you, they have a manufacturer's recommendation a lot of times, and there's other things that become dealership recommendations based on services they like to perform. So, some people I know they've taken those same vehicles and they've they've said, okay, here's the manufacturer recommendation, and here is the dealership recommendation, and then they'll go to another independent shop and ask for. You know what? Can you look this up in your system and just tell me, you know, what what do you recommend for a vehicle of this age? Um, is this one a four cylinder or a six cylinder? I'm just trying to put the pieces in my mind of what this is. Four, four cylinder. Okay. Four cylinder. All right. Well, just make sure you look at the factory uh, scheduled maintenance intervals and and play those fairly close. Have your driving habits changed any at all, Hattie? No, no, I've had it since about 2014. I, it did have a few miles on it, and I got it. So basically, I'm in, and I do, occasionally I'll put the high octane in it, maybe every fourth, fourth uh, tank or something like that. And some people say it doesn't matter. It's made for the other, you know. But you're driving the same routes you've been driving? You haven't changed your, your mm-hmm. habits any on where you're moving and where you're going? No. Okay. I, and I, don't, I don't go up in the mountain, up in okay. the mountain All too right. much. On it, you know? <laughs> well, you sound like you're you sound okay, like you really well. care about your vehicle and you want to do the best for it. But make sure you just like I said, find out what those manufacturer recommendations are. That are a lot of times they'll have an extended maintenance guide right with the vehicle. They don't always put it in the handbook anymore. A lot of times it's a separate maintenance guide that comes with the vehicle. If not, it can be found on the internet or a repair shop can find it. And and look at that, and then use that as your schedule and your budget to kind of plan what you need to do. And if your driving habits are are what we would call extreme, where you put on a lot of short trips, the engine doesn't ever get warmed up to full temperature. I, I don't know where that magic number is at. Let's just say you don't get a, a trip over 20 miles uh, often. Then you have to go into extreme service because you're you're not letting that engine get warmed up as often. You're not getting the moisture burned out of it quite as often. And then you might have to do things just a little bit different. But otherwise, just follow those recommendations, plan on that, and you can have a long life with that vehicle. Those things really... They go out a long, a long ways usually. So. But that dealership, nine hundred dollars, doesn't sound super outlandish, does it? I'd like to know what they're doing. Yeah, but, yeah, that's but for it does, sure. You know, it just all depends what they're doing. Well, but the what's a a tune up now? It, we would have said twenty years ago, get a tune up. If they put spark plugs in that, and then they went ahead and and they were going to do a fuel injection cleaning, mm-hmm. um, it can add up. You can, I know you can hit five hundred dollars really quick. Mm-hmm, for sure. <laughs> so. You For mentioned sure. timing belt. Why'd you bring that up? Anything with a timing belt, you've got to know when you're doing maintenance on a car, do I have a timing belt and what are the change intervals? Because if you have one and you don't change it and it breaks, you're going to be buying an engine in almost mm-hmm. every case. Now. And that's why we bring up that factor uh, maintenance intervals because right. there's some of these vehicles that they ran timing belts in longer than we even realize until we get one in the shop and, and the guys will be like, that's still got a timing belt in it? And then there's other ones that are... Oh, they put chains in that. I didn't realize they put chains in that. You know, they said they, mm-hmm. they, it's, you just really need to check to make sure. Hattie, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. We got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hear from you. 866 594 4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show.
Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's go to California and talk to Michael. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Michael, what can we do for you? Good morning, guys. Hey, I have a 2006 Toyota Tacoma, uh, the six-cylinder 4.0, and I have 290000 And my question is, I've never changed my coil packs on it. I've been regular about my spark plugs. Um, is that something I should do, or is it just change them when they go bad? Or do you, like, get lack of performance out of them? Not lack of performance, but lack of fire. You know, misfire is occurring because they break down. And as they break down, the voltage goes right through the side of the coil and grounds out to the cylinder head, and then it then it doesn't run well, and you get the misfire. I'm surprised it's made it this many miles. I'm not completely disbelieving that it's gone this far and worked well, but I'm, I'm a little... a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of miles for a, a coil pack. Our partner at Motorrad makes a lot of these coil packs for, for vehicles and, and other electronic parts, and uh, they, they make them, like we said before, because they fail. You know, otherwise these companies wouldn't make these kind of things. So they're, they're meant to be changed as a, as a maintenance item, too. They don't sell, they don't do a lot of spark plug wires like they used to. It used to be tune-ups. Let's put plugs and plug wires on it. Well, now it's put plugs and coils on them. You can put just the coil boot on. But we find a lot of our, our customers that have tried to do that on their own, they, put, they buy just the boot for, let's say, 15 bucks each. They put these things on. Maybe they got a kit. Maybe they're 5 bucks each. But they put them on, and all of a sudden they're like, well, it still does the same thing. I've replaced all the boots. Well, you got a coil that's bad. And when you buy the coil, it comes with the boot. So you're. What do you, know, you see for prices on coils? I mean, a Tacoma is a fairly common vehicle. So coils across the board for cars can be as low as about $30 a coil complete with the boot. And like I said, if you got a you know a $10, five, ten dollar boot, you might as well just get the whole coil. And I've seen them on the high end, really expensive ones when you start getting up into some of the even aftermarket co- coils for like an Audi or a Volkswagen or something. Sometimes those coils could be seventy five bucks a piece. And if you've got six of them, you know yeah, that yeah. adds up. But yeah, I'm thinking yours are gonna be uh, on the lower end. Okay. Yeah, I know if you buy them from the manufacturer they're in the $100 oh, range or something. Yeah, you don't you don't need to do that. You'd be you'd be fine. You'd be fine with the good aftermarket. And a lot of these aftermarket coils are identical to the the OEMs because a lot of the OEM stuff. I mean, if you look at OEM parts, next time you happen to buy one for let's say you have one you just have to buy it because it's not available somewhere else, look at the bag where it says where it's made. It amazes me when we pull out like we'll order a brand new AC Delco part for something when we can't get a different brand and I look at it, it says made in China. Okay, well, if that's made in China, it's made to their specs, which supposedly, we hope it is. But the aftermarket companies that are making something in China, it's still made to the same specs. So OEM is not always the best. Aftermarket is not always the best. But they do make, I, I know for a fact in our own shop, when we use our Motorrad products, they work very well for us. And I don't like the repeat comebacks because some of those coils are a bear to replace. Well, and you can look at the way that the marketing takes place, not the marketing, but the way the supply chain works, too, can be interesting. We just had in our shop where we were doing some inventory an EGR cooler from an like an 18 Ram pickup. And if you bought it from Mopar, that part was like 1400 or $1,700. And if you go to buy the part from Cummins, because it was a Cummins diesel, you can buy the same part for six or $700. And so it's, it's, it's the same part. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's just whatever supply chain it had to come through, it gets more steps on it, you know, and, and it can really drive the price up in a hurry with different people taking their piece out of the puzzle. And so you always got to look at that. Back in the day, we used to always know on the, the Rangers and the Mazda pickups. Mm-hmm. Y- you, could, you could have a Mazda pickup where the part would be $200, and you could go buy it from Ford as a Ranger part and buy the same part for $110. And they change you know? the they change the They change the. It could go both ways. They, they, they get kind of... Sticky with that. We have uh, these Isuzu NPR trucks that we get through iState Trucks here in Sioux Falls, and, and we love those things. They've been really great to us. We started off with diesels and then went to gas. Well, the, the diesels, when we started having to repair them at 300,000 miles, they were nickel and dime. So we said, we're done. We went to the gas. Well, they can be expensive because you got to fix like any kind of thing. So we thought, 
there's a 5.3 engine, there's a or 6.0 engine in this. It's got it's a Silverado truck, right? No. It's like uh, they had to put their little twist on it. We had one yesterday we're looking at, and here's an 08, so it should have the new style computer in it and the new style crank. Well, it turns out it's mixed and matched. They take an older style block with a, you know, they've got different VIN numbers like B, and they put the new style crank in it, so they're putting different electronics on it. Or they put the new style block with the old style crank, so you can't just go buy that engine unless huh, you swap apart. And one of them, they put a different cam in it, and they actually ran the engine backwards. We've told that story on the air mm -hmm. before where it was just like, why should I buy an $800 starter when I can buy this $150 starter? They look identical, <laughs> but one turns the opposite direction. They switch the they switch the way the armature runs, so it spins backwards, and then you, the, it never starts. So these little things they do, same parts, but you do a little digging, you'll be able to find some you know good quality parts at, at an affordable price. Does that help you out there, Michael? Yeah, can I go back to one question? You bet. Um, the previous caller you had mentioned um, the O2 sensor. Is that something? Oh that yeah. It's an O2 only only if you're having a failure. Yeah, so they're running fuel air ratio sensors on these, and they're very expensive. So if you don't have to replace it, don't replace it. They usually last longer than the oxygen sensors do, but they still start getting weak with age. And sometimes a fuel injection system cleaning will clean that up. But if you're not having a mileage drop off, if you're still seeing it's average about with what the other ones are, consumers are reporting as they're driving, I wouldn't mess with that oxygen sensor till it fails. I want to straighten something out on just from my own brain because I might have heard something different. So, Michael, you were asking about the – which sensor did you ask about? You said O2 sensor. Is that what you meant? Well, that, that's what – yeah, I, yeah, I believe yep. so. Yeah, that okay, was, all right, all right, because we which were is, talking about mass airflow sensors too and yeah, cleaning those and different things. The so. oxygen sensors are – they switched over to fuel air ratio sensors okay, later in life. It. So they'll save you some money. Thanks, very, Michael. Very good. 866-594. 4150. Let's talk to Paul. You're on the end of the hood show. Paul, what can we do for you? Paul, are you there? We lost Paul. Oh, no. I hope that wasn't his call. Like, I'm headed towards a cliff and my steering isn't turning. What should how, I do? How can I fix my steering right. quickly? My brakes aren't working. Is mm -hmm. there any way I can stop this vehicle? Yeah. Well, that'd be. Good that luck. is a. Good luck, Paul. I don't know if I want that call. <laughs> no, no. You guys uh -uh. just, if you're watching YouTube, you saw me try to work under pressure. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't I want don't that. I don't want that call. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Well, I've go, got something. Yeah, I do. I, but if you're jumping right on, I, I've got just a, if you live in Japan. I don't. Mm -mm. If anybody no. listening lives in Japan. Never even visited. And you want to get yourself a new Land Cruiser, you're going to have to wait. Uh-oh. <laughs> The new generation Land Cruiser, which is not going to be sold in the United States, which is really amazing. But four-year wait they're up to. Oh. It's huh. crazy. I'm reading out of Automotive News here, and they, they've got a, uh, they got a big backlog. They originally, in November or September, they said a two-year wait, and then it jumped to a four-year wait. And they're selling a ton of these things in the Middle East and in Japan. It's the new big platform it's the same as they're going to use for the Lexus LX full-size SUV. Those are very popular yeah. over there. Very and popular. My goodness, they said four years, and like I said, it, it's a, it's an all-new look. I got a feeling, I got a suspicion that you're going to see this thing in the United States as, as a Lexus yet. I think so. Available. They, they'd be, they're, they're just going to do it. Matter well, of fact, I think my wife and I just watched on Valentine's Day, um, J-Lo's got a new movie, a little rom, rom well, it wasn't even romantic comedy. It was just, it was Marry a, Me. Yeah, and I, I think she was driving a Lexus in that movie, one of, this, one of the safety vehicles, or one of her entourage vehicles. I think it might be on this platform. I don't know. I, oh, really? I, I'm going to go back. Now that I've read this article, I'm going to go, go back, back and, and look, look at that and see if, if it's the Lexus version of that. You watched a J-Lo movie called Marry Me, and you don't think it's a rom-com? Well, I don't know if it was actually, it wasn't that funny. Oh, the other who's the other? Fair enough. Yeah. It was good. It, it was, was a, a good. Rom. It was a good show. Not that calm. Well, I just didn't get a lot of it's, funny uh, out of it. It's well, it's it's J Lo and it's also Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson. So put those two together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's a question that came in on Facebook from Jim. It says, "Hey guys, longtime listener of your show. Sure, that's how they always start it. 
I have a 2018 Enclave that has lost the digital display for speed only. All the other display options show it has a regular speedometer, so it doesn't affect my driving, but it bothers my wife. It's her car. Possible cause and, com- and cost to fix, and is it something I can replace myself? Probably going to have to replace the, the instrument cluster to get that digital speed back on it. It's very common on instrument clusters for them to uh, fail. Electronics is just the same. Sometimes you can take them apart, and it's just a solder joint, like you know our board over here. When it starts cutting out on our board, we just tap, <laughs> tap it right it. in the. I'm not going to tap over here because it might no, untap know, it over yeah. there. So I try to be very gingerly during the show, but it could be the same kind of thing, you know. Uh, that if you look up videos on YouTube, you can come across a few of these things where they say, "Look, we've made a successful repair by soldering this joint." Now that's not for everybody, but for the people that it is for. It's a huge savings. If you could pop that thing out in, let's say, an hour to get it out and back in, and you spend 15 minutes soldering a couple joints and you put it back together and you've done it basically for free, and you could absorb the cost of buying that new soldering iron you've always wanted to in that, in <laughs> that price. And, and you got it for other things. That's how I've bought a lot of tools. It's like, well, I it, need to do something. Didn't he once tell a guy, yeah, you can pop that dash off. There's about 40 solder points, but I, yeah, you could do that. Remember that? And I, He knew I'm, the guy, apparently. Yeah. And I'm not really a big fan of doing that on a lot of things, but there are a few that, that I will do that on. I, it, if you know exactly, if somebody's already learned and they say it's here, Heat it up, put some new solder on it. It's good to go. There are a few of them you take apart. When you take the, the cover off, you literally look and say, there's no solder there. It's just a dry spot because they've missed them on thousands of instrument clusters. So Is there a, what's the cost on this so Jim can get If he has to get the instrument consent cluster. consent from his wife. Getting that instrument cluster could be anywhere from 200 to $400 is average. If the cluster is available, there's a lot of them now that have been discontinued because they weren't hot sellers. You sell a couple hundred a year, you're not going to produce them. You got to sell thousands of them to make money. What year was it again, Chris? 18. Yeah, the 18, you're probably going to be able to get it as a reman unit. They call them a reman unit right from the manufacturer. We're, we're finding a lot of remands coming through the manufacturers on the new ones that the aftermarket hasn't caught up with yet because there's not a big enough demand. But as the demand increases, they will. But it just floors me how many new ones fail. You'd have to. I would just get used to it, wouldn't you? I think I'd have to fix that. Oh, okay. I need to know how fast I'm going. Well, the speedometer works, just that display. I thought. Mm. We're going to take a break. Phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show, brought to you by Sturdivant's.
Prepare to learn something. You're going under the hood. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel and then join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Reggie Kite, who listens to us in Cooksville, Missouri. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood. Our partners over at UTI. Universal Technical Institute. They're your one-stop shop for everything automotive learning. Mm Knowledge-wise, you want to know how to work on cars. You want to get trained for a good career in automotive Visit Universal Technical Institute, uti.edu. 866 594 4150. Let's talk to Christoph. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, guys. Long time no talk. How are you? Hello, Mr. Cat. <laughs> nice to talk to you. Um, you? So I had a follow up question for that display cluster. I'm doing okay. Um, everybody is healthy, but, uh, you know, it, it, it turns on a dime. So. Yep. Um, but uh, speaking of making and breaking things, the um, the dash clusters now with um, these little LCD displays, and then you also have your infotainment screen. Yes. Um, are they doing an industry shift at all away from those LCD TFT displays that are just like way too bright at night and maybe switching over to ammo LED or something like that where black is actually black. There's no brightness behind it. Have you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they've used a lot of different display um, designs in these vehicles to try to get away from the glare and stuff. Uh, I've got a vehicle that's newer that has a very nice looking screen at night. Um, I think that's OLED on it. You can yeah. turn it down, but you still can't turn it down. I'd like to turn it down further, but it goes down far enough that yeah. it's comfortable to look at. Whereas another vehicle I have, it's actually not as bright as that newer one, but it sure is annoying. It just the color tones just make it very difficult yeah. to see the road. I want the Camaro. It, yeah, so Similar I want. My I, I cover it up. I have to, I got a little, I take yeah. a little piece of tape with a thing and I put it over the top of it to cover it. You do, it huh? Yeah, when oh, I'm driving boy. a lot at night because it's just the glare. In town, I'm fine. But if I'm on the highway where it's dark and you're out of the street lights, it's just, it's and too you much. can't turn it off? Is there an no, option? No, the these home? new okay. cars, they're just dim. They don't go down far enough. So the reason I'm asking, yeah, the reason I'm asking is for a specific vehicle. I have my eye on a, um, a 22 Kia. Um, it's a Telluride. Yeah. And they put a new feature in there where that little info screen between your between your gauges mm-hmm. at the center of your dash, now instead of just displaying what gear you're in, what your speed is, if you go to switch lanes, it'll turn on the surround sound or the surround vision cameras yep. on that side of the car and show you a blind spot view from the camera right in the center of your dash. I thought that's going to be great. But if you're at night and it's just as going to do like a mostly black screen but look like um, a white cloud shining at you because it turns on the brightness on the screen. They've then actually. when I turn on a backup camera, it yeah, goes like that. They've, so. Well, they've gotten really good in some vehicles. That, well, my newer one, it's got an amazing screen. When there's almost zero light behind me, I put it in reverse and I can see everything. And it's not night vision. It's a full color display and it looks great. I can see everything behind me that I could not see by just sticking my head out the window because it's too dark. It takes the light from the tail lights and the backup lights and it amplifies it enough to see everything very well. And I know the new Hondas, I've got a, a brother-in-law with a 2021 Honda Accord that has that side you turn the turn signal on and it shows in the mirror and it's it's a great picture. At night, daytime, cars coming up on you with the headlights on, you turn it on and it automatically adjusts. There's a little lag time in there. I can see when it first comes on, it goes from really bright to the focus in when it's night, but it's it's good, and I think they're getting better. They're I getting think you need to take better. your test drive at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm going to have to do that, definitely. And I think the suspicion that I have, too, is just working with technology. These screens, if they're sourcing them from the same places, obviously, that you would get like your iPhone or Samsung yeah. screens for um, a smartphone, I mean, a lot of these devices are not really designed to last more than a year, two years out in the wild. Of course, I'm running like a Samsung S8 phone for like, what, six years now? So um, 
I'm I'm the guy who just won't let it die. <laughs> but I imagine um, with the uh, chip shortage and the machine shortage and all those kinds of things, they're probably using the same sources. And so I would be surprised if we didn't get a lot more people saying, hey, this screen is not working, this screen is not bright enough, this screen just uh, got scrambled, what's happening? So, it's constant. We have, we have a crazy number of people that need screens replaced in 2018 and newer vehicles. I'm just... It just surprises me how many of these things have infotainment issues where they just don't light up or they go out, and it's either the screen or the the hardware itself behind there. But it, it just seems like too many to me because I suppose because we didn't do it for so many years, and now we are. Christoph, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Alan. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Alan, what can we do for you? Well, i got a bit of a, an odd one. Uh, 06 Chevy Cobalt, and um, several months back it started acting up. The, the transmission wouldn't shift out of second gear. Uh, when the windows weren't working all the time, sometimes they'd go up and down by themselves. The speedometer would flake out and go all the way up and back and then quit. Backometer, same way. For a little while, we started thinking maybe it was possessed or something. <laughs> Just a, a weird situation, so I got to study in it. Uh, uh, thought maybe it might have been the BCM, um, and I started doing some more searching, and I found uh, a section of wires under the hood uh, that were um, oh, they were fastened up against the block, but <clears throat> these were these were all live wires, and got to tugging on them, you know, just checking connections everywhere, and they fell apart. So I took, took it out, soldered everything back. Car worked beautifully. Everything worked for several months, for a few months. Then all of a sudden, <clears throat> transmission starts acting up again. Uh, none of the other conditions with it, just the transmission. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, it got to where it wouldn't wouldn't shift shift up uh, beyond second gear. So I thought, all right, it's in limp mode. Transmission's going bad. Um, but then I could drive it in second. Now, as long as I didn't hit 4,000 on the, on the tachometer, it would stay in second gear. If I hit 4,000, it'd start jumping back and forth between, uh, between uh, low and second. Um, so finally I thought, well, I'm going to try the cruise control. So I tried the cruise control, had it at 35 miles an hour, um, uh, and it was packing around 2,500. And it just ran smooth as silk. Then all of a sudden I came to a stop sign and took off again. And I hit resume on the cruise and it just seemed even better. So all of a sudden it shifted into the next gear. So I went ahead and pressed the accelerator and it shifted fine. But then after it sets a while, it'll go back to doing the same thing again. It'll bounce back and forth between low and second. So I didn't know if maybe as transmission fluid got warmer, it expanded, and maybe it's a low. Oh, because it also it also started slipping this last time around when it started acting up. So it quit the slipping now. Uh, but then when it's cold, it'll go back to all of that. So <clears throat> I've taken it over to a shop now, a local guy, and waiting to hear what's you know what they find um but it's my granddaughter's car just trying to get in good shape for her sounds like you've had it more than her (laughs) uh, yeah (laughs) yeah i have um but haven't been a haven't been a mechanic professionally for 20 years and everything has changed just a little bit for sure i would say what you're talking about with the fluid sounds definitely plausible those things are so hard to check fluid on or the, the average do it yourself or at home. Now that they're taking st- the sticks out of all these things, it makes it more difficult. But any kind of small leaks on those over a period of time can cause them to start slipping and have issues. That's the first thing I would look at with what you have. Now, they have had some wiring issues under the hood like you were talking about. But once you get that fixed, it sounds like you may have a, a fluid issue now separate. So but if they call you back and say, yeah, you got a fluid issue, hopefully they'll tell you, and we found the cooler lines leaking up by the radiator, so we need to replace those 
and get this so it doesn't leak again. That's probably all we got. Is going there, on. Russ? Is there enough electronics on that? Or they're going to want to monitor anything on the electronics and the transmission? To Once see? they check the fluid, they'll put a scanner on it and drive it, and they should be able to see the position of the valves and things like to that. To see if it's being Solenoids. commanded to do what it's doing, or if it's right. kind of doing it on its own. Correct. Because of where internally. So those are the things they're going to find out. Hopefully that fixes okay. it up. I hope so. I gave them all the information that I gave you, and and. One of the guys was just looking at me like, okay, okay, shut up and go on. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to start from scratch anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> A lot going on here. We'll, uh, we'll start. Alan, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Be sure to visit our website for news, contests, and previous shows at underthehoodshow.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to get back under the hood with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150 from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Dan in Idaho. Dan, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, good morning, guys. Love the show. Listen every week. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, what we're working on is a 2010 F550 service truck that we bought. It's a cabin chassis, really long truck, um, probably a 20-foot bed on it, I think, or 18-foot. So it's quite heavy. Um, we bought it with a, a blown-up engine. A 6.4 is kind of famous for that, I guess. 6.4 um, by turbo, yep. And, yep, and... We took it to the local diesel mechanic and had a Jasper reman installed. Um, my question is the boost levels. I'm used to, uh, I'm a Chevy guy, so I've got 200,000 on an LBZ, and it makes 20 pounds when you stomp on it. This twin turbo Ford makes a lot. 
it kind of freaks me out a little bit, to be honest. My question is, um, the truck's geared real low, so it wants to go 65. Um, 65 miles an hour, it's at about 2,300, 2,400 on the freeway. Um, locked up in fifth gear, and it's making, the other day I drove it, it said 24 pounds with a quarter throttle just cruising, which is kind of concerning to me. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is that motor supposed to make that kind of pressure? One of the things that I'll just throw in there as a generality, and Russ might be able to do more specifics, but I've done a lot of research in the last few years because people often asks us, ask us if we can use the engine out of the regular Super Duty in a 550, 450 application you get the same thing with, like, the Duramaxes between the pickups and the heavy chassis that they came out with in in, uh, in uh, whatever year that was where they started putting the Duramax back in the medium-duty trucks on GM. And about any of those, I'll say any of those medium-duty applications, like even, like, ambulances that are, like, E450s and things like that, they run that engine with lower horsepower and more torque than they will the conventional pickup or dually that somebody buys. Uh, they, they run the RPMs lower with a higher gear ratio. It's a commercial chassis, so they want to be able to detune that thing a little bit, use more torque and less horsepower to be able to get more longevity out of the engine for the, for the service company that buys it. That's the theory in general when you get to a medium-duty or a commercial chassis application. You're typically going to see less horsepower and more torque and, to- and, and lower gears to make that thing work. So having said that, it will operate and perform and seem different if you're going to compare it to a standard pickup truck. I just wanted to kind of get that out there for everybody because that is a common question that we get uh, in our business often. And there's not a direct drop-in swap. Now, sometimes the actual long block of the engine will be the same, but all the control accessories, which should have went right back on off of yours, are, are, are different Different computer, different turbo, different uh, a lot of that stuff uh, between the commercial chassis 450, 550, and then the actual pickup truck itself. So that's more of a generality. I don't know if it answers a specific question or not. Well, with the boost on there, one thing you got to be concerned with is has somebody put an aftermarket tuner on it before you bought it, and did that contribute to blowing up the engine because they've got too much boost on it, or they've even done one that's their own tune and they put too much boost on it? Uh, with that, that said, that was kind of my yeah. You you might want to. Re- I would reflash it because if you, if you don't have the tuner that came with it, and you don't know. I would reflash it back to stock just to see what you got because it may have an aftermarket in there, and you don't want it to run you know too much. But you've got a lot of weight going on the road, so if somebody has taken a an F five fifty like that and they've put a tuner on it, just with the weight you have and the RPM, you're going to have more boost, and it it wouldn't be so right. The temp- the temperatures were seven, eight hundred degrees. You know, I just was concerned that maybe a brake was dragging or something. Another question I had is, do you guys know where the boost sensor is? Where is it seeing that that boost pressure? Is it actually in the intake manifold should be or in is the it intake. on the charge side? Yeah, it should be on the on the intake manifold on that. That so you've got your exhaust temps are running just cruising down the road steady. You're up at that seven, eight hundred degree range at sixty five with yeah. no load. That's high. Yeah. Yeah, with no load on it. That's, okay. that's yeah, that's up there. Because I've got a, an older diesel that runs it runs almost 1,000 all the time, and that's normal. And when I, I talk to my guy in the shop with his 6.4, and he's like, what? And, you know, he goes, I'm, I'm not seeing that. He's got that a 6.0, doesn't he? Yeah. And so, but that's the same, yep. same setup there. You shouldn't be seeing that high of an exhaust temperature. You know, when you get a lot of weight on them, yeah, you're going to see more more exo- more more temp on there and but you've got to you got to know what what's going on with that computer because if they've got a tuner in there and they're not delivering the right amount of fuel for the right amount of boost you're going to get superheated exhaust and all sorts of issues you don't want dan thanks very much for the call good luck 866-594-4150 let's talk to walter you're on the end of the hood show walter what can we do for you yeah thanks for taking my call um got a 2018 edge and a while back, maybe three weeks ago, you talked about these four-cylinder engines. The trouble with spark plug and they have some problems with the engine getting hurt. 
Yeah, when you when you leave a spark plug in an engine so long that it falls apart, and a lot of these small turbo engines well, they want a they want a sooner than later spark plug change in them because they used to be a hundred thousand miles. They, that went on for a number of years. Before that, they were every you know twelve thousand miles on the real old cars to tune up once a year. But now it's they've they've made it longer. And and when we get into the you know we're in twenty twenty two now, and they're wanting some shorter changes some of these as short as thirty thousand miles and when russ said on the air the first time i think i was like i think i gave him a look like what mm -hmm. you've got to look at the service manual and see what your change and the, time is. the newest service manual right mm -hmm. i mean because when it was not your owner's manual for the right. car but the, the online service manual right. for recommendations for this engine yep. mm -hmm. yeah and we've talked we about that before not there's not as many vehicles that have that extended that that have the maintenance information Hard printed in their in their owner's manual because they do sometimes change things as they learn things. Probably more so about oils and different things I think have happened over the years. So they mm -hmm. went to a maintenance guide, but there is usually still a long term maintenance recommendation in one of those guides. It'll say this is it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that spark plugs is something that they probably have figured out when they make the vehicle that they don't change very much. But your Russ is exactly right. There's been things that have learned and they've they've mo they've modified what they say. No. That's what we thought we got to do this every 50,000 miles. And that's what you got to find is that latest service manual information. Walter, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Indiana and talk to David. You're on the end of the hood show. David, what can we do for you? I've got a 2017 Lexus RX 350 all wheel drive. And this is not a big deal, but it's been bugging me. Uh, 2,000 miles ago, I replaced the brake pad, the rotors, and the, the hardware that come with the pad. And uh, the brakes work wonderfully. But when I come to a stop, I've got like a little grunt. I think that's the best I can explain it. Coming uh, from, I think, the brakes. And it doesn't, doesn't affect the performance. It's just, I'm, does it, could it possibly be that, these brakes need to break in a little bit, and it'll eventually go away. Have you ever heard of that? Are you having a situation? I just got to ask this quick. Are you having a situation when you slow down? It seems like there's another little extra stop, or or because this is a to just a noise. It's the uh, noise. Just a noise. It's the brake it, noise. It hits again. It's just the noise. And as I as I'm doing right now, and when it comes to the complete stop, it's like a a, a oh. little grunt. Yeah. I've seen that before, a lot of brakes, and it does have to do some with braking in, but it also has to do with the type of brakes you put on it. Some of them are good quality, but they're a little more aggressive. So when they get down to that slow spot, they start grabbing, and they'll stop, and then they'll release a little bit because it's getting to a, a friction point in the rotor and the pad together where it stops really quickly, and then as it pushes past it, now it's loose again. Kind of like trying to tighten up a stripped bolt. It's got a tight spot and then a loose spot and then a tight spot and a loose spot as you're going around. And that's what you're having with the brakes. If the problem does not go away after, um, you know, I would say typically I'd say a thousand miles or 2000 miles of in town driving, I would definitely go back and say, Hey, I've got a problem with these. Go back to the parts store where you purchased them and see if they'll swap them out under warranty and if it does the same thing again, you'll need to switch to a different type, you know, different brand, because some brands just don't, when they, the way they engineer them, they're just not really good for your application. I really have a strong feeling that after a number of miles, it'll eventually go away or it'll start, it'll trade off that grunt for, for squeaking when you step on the brakes. So uh, it depends on the content of the brake pad, semi-metallic, organic, stuff like that. And sometimes it's working perfectly fine. It just makes a noise. We had a call recently where they had like a squeaking noise and a squealing noise, brought it to the dealer, and they said, yeah, no, that's normal. I just, you got to deal with like it. I don't like it. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it yeah. <laughs> David, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. A real quick shout out here. I've had this note with me forever. Carol Torbison, uh, he's got a 05 Park Avenue out in Mitchell. He listens all the time. He's, he loves these cars. Um, appreciate being a loyal listener out there. I I just, I've had this note here forever, and I just wanted to give him a shout-out. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturt Events. Thanks for listening. If you like listening, maybe you'll like watching. Check out our YouTube channel, and you can watch the show as we do it.
This is the Under the Hood Show for Russ Evans, Shannon Nordstrom. I'm Chris Carter. Thanks for joining us on the Under the Hood Show. Hi, hello. Now we are. are you there? Uh, you've been. You were watching earlier. You were watching. Oh, you know what? I can do it while the mics are on, right? I can turn on the video game. Yeah, you could. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good idea because I'm. No, not, no, no. We're, don't play it. But I, I wanted I would, to show it. I, I really want a rematch, but Shannon I don't think I'm ready for it. Shannon can't play. That's so that 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 you're looking at right there, we have a video don't do game it, Russ. set up. Don't do it. You don't can't play. play. Don't, don't do play. it, Russ. I'll just take Shannon off. Don't. And Russ and Shannon to, were, were playing a little bit during the break, and Russ was like, hey, we could turn on the mics and talk during the break. And then Shannon played the video game for five minutes, and we're like, oh, no, we can't air no, that. we can't air that kind of stuff on It TV. wasn't that bad. It I, was pretty bad. I said that. Yeah, you, you, word. you just, used video just, game just, language. Just that one. Yeah, look so. at that! I, I zapped Shannon, so he's back. He's back there. Don't it wasn't even, like don't look it at wasn't the, like Kyle Larson or anything. I just no, I it just was said a swear right. word. Yeah, a couple times. Yeah, I, uh, uh, consistently and regularly. Well, but Russ, I, the last race I was actually doing pretty good, and then uh, he throws I an EM. Pul- he throws an EM pulse on me. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know you could do that. I was I had this green lock around yeah, me, and right there. I was just going for the home stretch, and yep. I don't know. I this is gonna be a. I hope people enjoy a little extra fun in the break, but I don't know if it's good for Shannon. No, because you'll your body will shut down. I, I, we just you'll hands get sweaty and he's sitting right there, just in front of me, just waiting. I, I, I don't, bye bye. No, he just shot me. I did. I don't know. If this is like when I try to play video games with my bye kids. Bye. Russ, did you buy this specially for this, or did you have this? No, I've had this for years. So, mm-hmm. um, what is what game is that? It's a Sega Dreamcast, and that game is called Revolt. Okay. It's an, it's an RC car game. You can choose your Type of car, gas or electric, and so did you choose my car for me? Uh, I did in this one. They're both uh, uh, they're both basic cars, but they're. Did you they're, oversensitize my steering oh so boy. I look drunk? No, no they're in. Listen they're, to him. It's beginner mode for you. Jeez, um, I will. I will win at this game. They've, they've <laughs> got some. They've got some cool ones, but after you play it a long time, you can actually like any game. You get really good at it. But there's. Have you played Forza Five yet? No, I can't remember the last time I played a racing game of any sort with a joystick. The. Uh, the boy, the one that no uh, wheel. the yeah. one that belongs to my family, he got Forza Five. Oh, looking at that game versus the, just it's back, ridiculous. Back up. Would you say the boy, the one that belongs to your family? Yeah, yeah, my son. Okay, well, yeah, that's why so yeah, fancy. I don't, I don't know. Is there uh, another one that doesn't belong <laughs> no, to your family? No. But. There's a lot of people that are buying these old. <laughs> these things are getting expensive now. This the the retro stuff, the Ataris and things. People yeah. are buying them because they just want those little. You know what I got different. in the basement? Not you know why? Not in you the know, basement. You know up. why they're buying them? Because the '87 Grand National. Old yeah. people yeah. now are yeah. remembering. You know what I got in the basement? I think you know about it. I don't ever use it. What's that? Put away now, actually, in storage, and it's not mine. It was for my son. He was all into it. Riley was. But we have got the actual Dance Dance Revolution. Oh. Um, not the not the rollout pads. We've got the metal. Oh. The metal. Three foot by four foot. I remember when you got arc- that arcade you version that. with the handles on them. We'll mm-hmm. break those babies out someday and, and <laughs> sell them because they they're probably get oh, valuable. Thought we we're gonna do that during the break. <laughs> no, I think those are worth. Some big Welcome bucks. back. Yeah. People wanted to see. They're like, "What are you doing in the you break?" You do not want to see me dance. <sighs> you do not want to hear me sing. And I'm thinking you don't want to watch me race with a joystick. You don't either. want to hear them. Race on the video game. You said the brakes were awkward before. Now they're yeah. really brakes. So uh, we're out there. You got a parking lot cam on there. You got a video game. Mm-hmm. You got all sorts of different Just things. Just trying to make it more interesting because if you're new to the show, while we're doing the live stream, we are actually sending a show live to our biggest local affiliate in this in the yeah, that's the our line. home station. And you you require on radio you have to take a break when you hear those commercials. A lot of the, Chris could explain what happens in commercials, but they have to be there. There's certain things. So you're Timing live on is, people go, wait a second, you're live on YouTube. Why are you taking a break? It's mm-hmm. like, well, because we're tired. We gotta go to the bathroom. But you know, <laughs> other than that, yes, you do have to take you have to take a break. You have to 
uh, you know, the call screeners lining up calls. There's buttons or rebooting the be, phone system. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of things that go on during these breaks, but we can find other ways to entertain you while you're waiting for us. A lot, most of you people, if it's nine to five. So while that break's going on at the top of the hour for us, you may not know it's the top of the hour. There's national news playing across yep. on the local station. And that's the issue. We can't yep. play the local station's audio. So over. that's so we we just got to go. Some of it we can because it's go ours, down for a little yeah. bit. But and Kello AM 1320 and 107.9, they have been just excellent. You know, that's been the group we've worked with to grow the show. Uh, you know, that's the station that Midwest that uh, Chris mm-hmm. works for. And they've been excellent about letting us facilitate to make this happen. And. Sending, I mean, this just doesn't happen that often. That sending a signal from a remote studio right into a live feed of a radio station, and we really appreciate them allowing us to do this. But that's why we have it the way it is. And so, speaking of which, April fourteenth, yeah. I won't be here. Okay, because Midwest Radio Sioux Falls has been named the Children's Miracle Network Partner of the All Year. All right, so we will be down at right. the. Uh, Children's Miracle Network National Gathering. April 14th, huh? Just tax day almost. Is that in Orlando again? Yes, it is. (laughs) Yeah. I bet you hate that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm thinking about not coming back. They are asking you to come down to be part of that, right? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I'm just going. (laughs) They're taking some. I'm going to drive down and bust in. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been raised for Children's Miracle Network. Uh, Over $10 million. Total, yeah. but yeah, this this year we've raised hundreds of thousands. So yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, whatever. I mean, that's, that's not yeah. whatever. No, nah, I know, that's pretty special. Yeah, it's pretty. You've great. affected a lot of lives and made. And it's the whole, people. the whole group, all of our stations that work on it, and the people. There's, it's a really cool deal. So I won't be here April fourteenth. No, I'm already missing you. <laughs> All right, that'll do it now, There's, right? There'll probably be no racing on April fourteenth. I guessing. doubt. Yeah, I. I that would be yeah. one too many things less for, button push. One too many things for us to try to, because we've done it without you uh, a couple of times, and we, we will have to do it again. Yeah. But it, it, it's harder. I well, I've done it. I'm just pushing buttons. That's the reason I'm so good at it. I'm not answering questions. I can sit back here. I'm like a, I'm like a, just taking the picture. I'm not even reading the defense. I'm just pointing the camera at the defense. I'm just the <laughs> guy taking the picture over the top. So, as we get out of Super Bowl season, you want to talk about the car commercials on the Super Bowl? Yeah. So if you noticed, all of them except for I thought it was one, but Chris pointed out two were all about electric cars. They are so trying to indoctrinate the world. People come into our shop all the time, and they tell us they're like, "Oh, you know these electric cars? They're never going to catch on. They're never going to start selling those." And it's like. Have you, were you living under a rock? I mean, have, are you not paying attention to how many electric cars are out there? Oh, they don't have any. There's, there's, oh, well, they got those Tesla things, right? I'm like, no, there, there are hundreds of them out there. We and talked about the, bu- the budgets of the manufacturers are crazy that they're yeah. dumping into research and development. Last week, we talked about Norway. In January of this year, 82 or 84% of all cars sold in Norway were electric. Yeah. So. so here's the thing. People say, well, why would they spend, you know, billions of dollars on developing these cars? It's like, well, back a few years ago, somebody in office said by 2020, whatever, you're going to have to have cars this much cleaner and this many more miles per gallon. What's our EPA rules? We're forcing them on you. You've got to make these better. So it's going to cost you billions of dollars to get to that point. And they're like, I, that's a lot of money. And I don't, well, what if we don't do it? Well, well, you can't sell cars. No, we're just going to sell electric, so we're 100% exempt on those cars from emissions and miles per gallon. Oh, now watch. They'll, they'll implement some kind of, nope, it doesn't go far enough on a charge. You're you're going to get penalized. Well, yeah, heck with you guys. Anyways, um, they are now spending less money is what they're claiming. They're spending less money developing the electric cars than they were just trying to make the gas ones cleaner and produce them. And they just keep adding more and more stuff to these cars because the fuel is is garbage compared to what it should be. They need more octane. They need better quality fuels in order to get internal combustion engines to run better. Some of the companies, though, like Toyota, Mazda, Nissan, they've been experimenting with uh, hydrogen, but not using fuel cells and electric, but going with direct injection into these engines to get the same thing. So that's kind of cool, too. But as far as the Super Bowl went... There were some really cool car, 
commercials on there, but they were. I already really forgot geared. them all. Yeah, they were geared <laughs> towards. How about you forgot Doctor Evil? That's pretty good. Yeah, that 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 was good. Supposedly, there's another Austin Powers movie coming out, and that's why they were able it. to. They're teasing and getting I'm it amazed. out there again. They they looked pretty good for that. You know, the last movie came out a very long time ago. Yeah. That, that was enjoyable just to see the characters, I thought. Yeah. You know, just to see them do that. And the mini, mini me. That was funny. The grandbaby. That was cute. <laughs> but the, the electric platforms they talked about, the you know, the Hummer commercial was last. Can you believe that's been a year ago already? Remember that? Yeah, now this year it was a Silverado EV commercial instead. I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not real up on that Silverado. I think it's kind of mm-hmm. ugly. Looks like a big avalanche. Yeah, that's what everybody says, though. I mean, when they put out the last, when they yeah, redesigned the Silverado, everybody it's going it to grow ugly. on now me, of course. Yeah, but yeah. right see, now, see. I'm just like, no, it's not my thing. And, it, you know, the, and people will say, well, unless you're going to buy one, I mean, you really can't talk. It's like, no, I'm not going to buy one. And I was reading the article about talk. the new Tundra, the Tundra yeah. redesign, and they were saying it hasn't been, it's the newest, it's the first design in 15 years. And they said, that might not sound like a lot, but imagine if this one stays until 2037. Oh. <laughs> I, there is huh. a gas motor commercial during the Super yeah. Bowl. Look at the Volvo. Keep it up with the Joneses and yep. then the Jonas Brothers. That's yeah. the one he talked about. And then the Nissan, the, the new Nissan. The three, the three, or the Z. Yeah. Did yeah. you see that commercial? Oh, yeah. yeah, I've been, I was waiting for have, that one. Have you been, so have you been watching the teaser for that where they're showing him jumping through the fire and all that? And that, that is a fun did you, car. Did you realize no. who the driver was? <laughs> no. I didn't either. And then when they <laughs> I showed. I didn't realize anything. <laughs> when they showed Still the don't. whole commercial, then I went. No way! I had no. Who idea. was the driver? Huh? It was uh, um, Eugene Flaherty. Yeah, or you, uh, Eugene Levy. Yeah, he was in. He was the dad in American Pie. Oh, sure. Okay, you know, yeah, the, I, I recognize the, that. Yeah, you know, the, conserv- yeah. the well, conservative, so the conservative father. Uh, yeah. you know. they're trying to get all the old dorks like me to get excited about a hot car and go buy it. Well, mm-hmm. did you? They they were kind of telling you, look, this is the transformation you get when you drive the Nissan. Because yeah. he went from they're like, would you like to drive my car? Yeah, exactly. And he, he's like. No, this cup of coffee is my excitement for the day. <laughs> and he drives the car, and all of a sudden, you know, he's got the long hair. He's like, I'm cool. It was a cool commercial. You know, there are a lot of good commercials on there, and the car commercials were, were, were pretty good. The little robot dog yeah, getting charged by the... they're pretty good. I, my favorite one, though, is... The Polestar one that said we're not worried about Mars. Yeah, my, <laughs> that was my favorite commercial out of the whole thing, though, was, for some reason, it just it's kind of like the GoDaddy one from years ago, but the, the Larry David, nah... You know the yeah. we, the wheel, man. Nah. <laughs> you know, just it was a another crypto commercial, but it was that was it. I got a kick out of that commercial for some reason. I, which one was yours, uh, Russ? I I laughed out loud when I watched the robot dog okay. thing at the end where he was charging him up because he's he's jumping off the yeah, he's, he's going to jump dark. into the sunroof and is like oh man and yeah, then he, then he's down to the ground he's like come on little buddy yeah. <laughs> I think I laughed hardest when they didn't call that false start on the last drive that was the part where i went oh they just lost the super bowl because the refs oh, when they, they missed the face mask penalty yeah. and i went right, so that one really could be made up yeah. though that last drive with a minute left when the refs blow that man eh, it's kind of yeah that's something too you know they <laughs> keep their po- whistle in their pocket for the most part until the last oh, and then blow the oh yeah. God, oh I would hate to be a they, Bengals fan. They, it, it was like it's every, not great being a Vikings fan. Every but start, you're like, new just, coach today. Just I've just never lost the, the Super Bowl. <laughs> the flags were coming out. It's like, hey, is it, can I borrow one of yours? I'm, yeah. I'm all out. I got to get like, these all out. We haven't, we haven't been involved. <laughs> it's just Guys, like, it's the Super Bowl. We're supposed to, they got to see us. Grandma was watching. Like, you have a foot to go. You have six inches to go. Come on. It, they're, they're, <laughs> they're not going to snap that thing. Oh. All right, that'll do it. Uh, thanks for watching, and thanks for clicking the bell and subscribing and the notifications and all that stuff, all right? Ding. All right, there you go.